over to you. Thanks, Joe. Um, so as Joe is introduced, I'm going to be talking about some of the, the health and safety elements. Uh, I think it's safe to say that whether people are already back in work or the return process is being planned, that the pandemic has certainly highlighted health, safety and well-being as a fundamental factor in any business operations. And talking about the need for businesses to adequately assess, plan and manage the health and safety of their staff, because this can make to the physical and mental health as well as overall business performance and success. Now if we cast our minds back 16th of March 2020 the British government told us all right go work from home um, and continue to work from home where possible. A year on and research estimates that 60% of us are still working from the confines of our own home and this hasn't come without its mental health impact and this this impact that is driving the need for health and safety to be prioritised. So on average, 21% of people currently going into their normal workplace aren't satisfied with the health and safety measures put in place with that by their employer. So that's a bit of a concern. And we certainly don't want 21% of our employees having that same concern. And 32% of those are anxious about either catching or spreading COVID in the workplace. So there, there are concerns, societies, hence why I'm going to be talking about some of the elements that should be considered by employers to reduce the, the anxiety and mental health impact. If we can have the next slide, please. Okay, so according to a survey by Newfield Health on home working, 80% of people have reported that working from home has negatively impacted their mental health. So not being in the physical presence of colleagues, or it may mean people feel unable to take a break or step away from them. And this is contributing to a higher level of anxiety and stress in general. There are many people struggling to gain a work-life balance when working from home and 30% of people find it difficult to separate the difference between work and home and 27% of people reported having trouble switching off at the end of the day and it is difficult sometimes to stop work like bleeding into the home environment when that's where all of our work and all of our home um, is. We recently did a blog on or dealing with working from home so please check out our website if you do want to share some of those tips with your employees. So looking at the statistics, I do think that getting people back into the workplace could understand, understandably be a positive thing for many people because working from home is having that impact. So it should be stated that any return to work should be done in accordance with government guidelines because we are still under restriction. So employers would need to justify the work being done in the workplace if you are considering a return in the very short term, i.e. what makes that work essential, you might have people within the workplace. I know some possibly after restrictions have eased, um, but regardless, I'm going to be going through the considerations of the return process to maximise effectiveness whilst also reducing health. And these include First and foremost, planning the return thoroughly and risk assessing for physical health, hygiene and mental health. So as well as the physical safety elements, okay, so things like strategy, making sure equipment is safe. It is important to make sure the actual working environment is safe and is conducive um, to protecting health. And these will include things like hygiene, provision. So for example, employers should be identifying shared equipment and appliances and surfaces, things like kettles and microwaves in a kitchen, or it could be shared equipment like a pump truck or a trolley that you use as part of work. Also identifying touch points within the workplace itself and identifying what would be an appropriate level of cleaning to make sure that we are spread within that um, work area. G. We'll also need to look at how we're going to prevent spread between people, so segregation and social distancing. And employers should be looking at place and looking at the areas in which people could generally congregate or could be closer than two metres. So that could be walkways, corridors, entrance and exit points, areas where perhaps people clock in and clock out, and looking at how to comply with social distancing and how we can segregate people as much as possible. And I think lots of businesses will be really good at managing social distancing, maybe as part of the work, but it is also important to consider how we're going to clean that when people are on break. 
and in the rest facilities. So it's not just about the actual work. We do have to consider how we're going to keep people apart and keep people social distance when they are on their breaks as well. Plus, do we have any areas perhaps where it's quite confined and we may need to stipulate maximum numbers to stop social breach and also consider any activities that might require people to work with each other and appropriate controls to prevent spread, which may include providing personal protective equipment or PPE. And I know lots of organisations who are currently in work but also planning the return, they're also policy around just general wearing of masks within the workplace. So similar to like what you would have in a coffee shop, for example, when you're sat at your table and you're eating and you're drinking, you'd have to have a mask on. But as soon as you get up and you're away from that seated position, you have to have a mask. So lots of organisations are considering a similar approach at your desk or you're sat eating or drinking, you don't have to have a mask. But as soon as you um, come away from that workstation um, or that table that you sat on, you have to wear a mask. And it's certainly best practice, one of the things we are recommending to our clients um, when considering the return. So as well as general PPE considerations, you also what about your first aiders? Now, hopefully we're not having accidents and incidents uh, left, right and centre when we go back. But should there be an injury or someone feel unwell, we want to make sure that the first aiders and the persons receiving treatment are kept safe. So identifying additional PPE for first aiders and briefing them on the procedure of donning that PPE and protecting themselves and others where that close contact may occur. Stepping back into the wider workplace, we know that air supply and ventilation is a factor in the spread of COVID-19. So identifying areas within your workplace, any rooms, any confined spaces where perhaps adequate airflow might not be possible. So, for example, if you have a room that doesn't have an openable window, for example, maybe have a procedure that only one person works in that room or we close off that room. So, again, identifying areas where ventilation may not be sufficient and having adequate controls in place. And then in terms of the day to day stuff, that's it, but we do have to consider what happens when something goes wrong. Have we considered any tweaks or any, for example, our fire evacuation? Have we told staff or will we be telling staff that actually getting out of the building in the event of a fire is more important than social distancing? But then you may need to consider social distancing perhaps at the assembly point. And then in terms of other things that can go wrong in terms of COVID, what's the process to be followed if someone becomes symptomatic in work or they get contacted by test and trace to advise they've been con in contact with a positive case? Now, normally lots of organisations will say, well, OK, that's, if that happens, we send them home. But what if someone's too unwell to drive or they've come to work on public transport? Is there an area perhaps they can quarantine until they can be collected or we can identify a safe way of getting them home? And also considering an escalation process, if there is a suspected outbreak or workplace exposure. So that might be additional cleaning, perhaps closing an area of the workplace. So having those emergency procedures in place and including that in the planning process. And this process will always work better with the input and the involvement from others. So employers should identify who needs to be involved in this planning and risk assessing process. And not only during this stage, but when we get people back to work, because we'll need to make sure what we have written down in a plan now is actually working and it is actually workable and keeping people safe in practice. If anyone needs to know more about what needs to be assessed for the return to work, or if you're already back and you perhaps want a little gauge on you know, where we're at, we have a workplace guidance document that has a return to work checklist and a template risk assessment, which is based on government legislation and health and safety executive guidance. And this has been popped in the handout box for everyone to access. So feel free to download it um, and use it to assess your, your end. And the importance of having these plans is really, really great for the employer because you can be satisfied, you've assessed your risk, you've, you know, you have controls in place, but that plan isn't just for the employer, that's essential for communicating to your staff because now you have something tangible to communicate. And that plan and that communication should allow them to understand what the return to work is going to look like, what's expected of them when they come back, and reassure them that reasonably practicable measures are being taken to protect them. 
So research conducted by the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development identified that only 55% of people said they'd been given adequate information about the return to work. And a lot of the time, where we have information that is unknown, that can trigger stress. Change is also something that can cause stress or bring on stress. And although we would have all gone through a change process when we were first told to work from home, we've now become quite accustomed and we almost feel safe and normalised in this working environment. So getting people back into the workplace is going to be another transition, another change process. So we need to consider that and be providing adequate information. Because no one, leave, no one wants to knowingly put themselves at risk. We all want to go back to work. And when we go back, focus on the work that we're there to do. We don't have to be sat there worrying, oh gosh, is my employer doing everything that they should be doing? Are they doing enough? Do, do I feel protected? Is my health a priority? No one wants to do that. No one ever wants to go to work to enjoy work, to carry on with it. So the purpose of the assessment and planning stage in advance means you can communicate that out and provide employees with an opportunity to raise questions or queries. And that's also important because those questions may highlight something we haven't thought of. So that's quite handy. Or it might be something that we already have in place, but perhaps we haven't communicated it clearly enough. Or it might just be something that we just need to provide some extra reassurance of to particular individuals or across the board. And as well as briefing staff, we also need to brief managers. We need to brief them on the potential mental health impacts and also their roles and responsibilities in supporting staff and maintaining health and safety standards at work and then the areas of their control. And I, I'd like to think when we talk about communication that employers have already put some form of mechanisms in place because let's face it, we've been working from home for all this time. So hopefully we've been communicating, but it is important as well as just keeping people informed that that communication is two way and we're actually consulting with staff. The 62% of people from the CIPD study didn't feel adequately consulted and are actually anxious about returning. And consultation can provide a real positive in terms of reducing anxiety, especially about the return to work. So consultation should include what activities would be expected to be done in the workplace, what the return will look like, what work is essential, and then agreeing how that work can be done safely. A lot of organisations have already been doing this consultation process. This won't be anything new. We've had organisations sending out staff surveys, getting people involved in the risk assessment process, doing individual risk assessments or stress risk assessments, or organisations keeping people updated so they feel involved and reassured. But regardless, it is important that that explains what's expected, what the return will look like, and that it reassures staff of the procedures to be followed for their health and their safety. And then once we're back in the workplace, the process doesn't end there, uh, the monitoring and review should continue because what looks good on paper right now might not quite work or it might need to be tweaked when we actually get back to the workplace. So we need to encourage feedback once we're back as well, that consultation continues, both positive feedback and obviously anything that needs to be improved. And then risk assessments and safe working procedures, we would recommend to be reviewed monthly to make sure that what we have written down is actually what's happening in pra practice and vice versa. And one thing I would say as well is, yes, let's use other indicators as well, as well as talking to people about how well we're managing things. So perhaps worth linking in with HR and absence records just to see if there's any trends or any indicators as to any concerns. So if we can have the next slide, please. Now, we talk about the return to work process and lots of us have been working from home, but research suggests that 26% of us plan to continue to work from home either permanently or occasionally once the whole COVID situation um, sort of dies down. So whether home working is something that is being planned by an employer or whether there's considerations of maybe a more hybrid approach, employees will need to consider the health and safety requirements of this. So for example, physical safety. If we have staff that have equipment to use at home, how are we checking the condition of that equipment? How are we maintaining it? If, for example, you already have a PAT testing regime, for example, for your portable electrical equipment, how are you maintaining and sustaining that policy? Are you perhaps saying to staff, look, come into the workplace on a set date so we can test your equipment? Or 
or it, will there perhaps be an arrangement where staff can organise part testing for themselves but through an approved provider? So these are things that need to be considered. So we've got physical safety, then we've got physical health, the ergonomics, the posture side of things, things that can impact people's physical health. And we've had lots of client conversations with clients recently about display screen equipment and DSE in particular. It is our consideration of home working may become a flexible element and employers will need to consider how they will comply with the DSE regs in terms of how are they going to go about completing risk assessments, how are they going to ensure that economically and in terms of providing adequate equipment. So there's a lot of decision making and planning that needs to go into that and what will be essential is that organisations have designated people who are trained as DSE assessors to be able to identify what's needed to ensure the staff are working ergonomically and with good posture. And then finally, so obviously we know that there are impacts of working from home, such as isolation, lack of interaction, lack of communication. So what mechanisms will be in place to support employees if home working is going to be a continued element? If we can just go on to my final slide, that'd be lovely. So just going to on the screen in front of you is just an overview of some of the services we've been providing lots of clients with and in, uh, in terms of what I've just been discussing but investing in the safety and health of your people means that they're more likely to turn up to work while they're at and this can build into the bigger picture in terms of health and safety culture and also making sure that businesses remain operational and, and, and productive as well so on that note I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to pass you over to Neil who's going to talk a little bit more about employee benefits. Thank you Steph and I think you've given us a lot to, to think about. Um, so thanks for all for joining us today. I'm going to talk about um, the importance of utilising employee benefits to support your employees well-being and mental health. Next slide please Chrissy. I'm just going to cover, so really just kind of cast my mind back to um, how employee benefits have evolved immensely over the last couple of years. How you may have um, some added value benefits that you've already got, you may not realise you've got it, and how you can maybe use that then to help the employee benefits with things like employee assistance programmes and stuff like that. And then um, some maybe suggestions on how to communicate the employee benefits to obviously the employees as well. So I've been in the employee business now, well, far too many years to be honest with you. And I've really seen it change um, over the last couple of years. If you kind of cast your mind back to the days before to enrolment, um, you were kind of lucky if you had a, a group pension plan and you were extremely lucky if you had a group life policy tied into that as well but with obviously auto enrollment it did kind of um, change the dynamics of employee benefits because every company has to make a pension scheme available so employers were kind of looking at other avenues um, in which they could you know look at to attract and retain and obviously help employees at their time of need so it has really changed you know and the solution nowadays doesn't have to be expensive and the return you have on your employee benefits can be you know at times well in excess of your month i mean you now have so many employee benefits choices available to uh, the employees you've got group life you've got group income protection private medical insurance, critical illness, you've got the flex plan, um, and you a benefit that doesn't cost the earth um, in the cash plan. Now, um, providers have really kind of upped their game with these uh, benefits, because it's, it's like, if you think about it, it's like going into a supermarket and you buy one benefit, and you kind of get three or four free, because a lot of these benefits have um, added value benefits so things like your employee assistance program, your GP helpline, your um, early intervention uh, and rehabilitation. And obviously providers use these benefits because it kind of helps, it can help certain conditions, um, you know, negate it up to a claim down the road. So from an employer's perspective, it does help with um, employee absenteeism. If you can go to the next slide, please, Chrissy. So I've just got a slide here, and if you look at, this is from um, Aeon's uh, recent insight report, and it just kind of goes to show the how employers' buying behaviours have changed over the last um, 
sort of with the pandemic. So if you look back to uh, 2019, uh, you can see kind of highlighted, obviously you've got, um, you know, cost is a big consideration. So you've got the first bar there, which is premium. You've got obviously administration, how easy it is to administer, the terms and conditions, the claims administration, but you've then got um, added value services. So as I was talking about earlier on, the employee assistance programme, the GP help life, things that can really help the employees. And stats show that back in 2019, 18% of employers were looking at what added value benefits uh, providers made available alongside, obviously, just the group pension, uh, the group group life policy or the clash plan. So if you look at that now uh, and the graph on the right hand side, 2020, you can still see the premium is. Um, you know, obviously is the main factor, but that buy-in behaviour then has changed from 18% to 31%. So, you know, employers are now considering, well, what else do I get for my premium? And also alongside that, you can now see that employers are looking at early intervention and rehabilitation as well. And more importantly now with obviously, you know, with the pandemic, um, you know, it does appear that surviving the virus is, is really the only only the you know the initial ongoing battle really you've got you know a lot of people unfortunately suffering from long covid now and many employers have adapted their uh, employee benefits with the early intervention and rehabilitation to include um long covid support you know and that includes then phone support advice fatigue management uh, structured exercise program to help the employee uh, restore fitness you know, work focused health coaching, return to work, you know, an additional benefit that you may have aligned to the benefit you may have now or you're considering to have that's available at no cost to you as an employer. Uh, next slide, please, Chrissy. So one of the um I think one of the one of the great benefits available, and they've certainly seen an increase in the usage of this over the last uh, year is an employee assistance program. Now these are usually aligned alongside your group life policy, um, group um, critical illness, your cash plans even as well, which you can you can have from as little as just over a pound a week uh, for your employees. And these are 24 hours, seven day a week, 365 days a year confidential helpline for the employees, but also for their families and their children as well. Uh, some providers also offer face-to-face -face counselling alongside the 24-7 um, uh, confidential helpline. They've also, a lot of the providers have actually got on-course workshops for line managers as well, just to kind of help them um, to spot the, um, you know, the early symptoms of stress in the employee. And I know that's a bit more difficult when employees are working from home. And, you know, the, these employee assistance programmes, it covers, you know, anxiety, stress, depression, drug abuse, obviously there's been an increase in domestic violence, you've got relationship problems, career issues, furlough, you know, there's so many different elements of help available through the employee assistance programme. There's some stats there that we've had from Health Assured that just goes to show that, you know, since the beginning of lockdown in March 2020, calls have really reflected, um, you know, and it kind of followed a pattern with regard to lockdown with easing and um, uh, and increasing of lockdown as well. And they've seen an increase of 36% of anxiety calls related to COVID-19. And in 2020, anxiety, low mood, employment, again, the worry about losing their job, what's going to happen to them, financial, partner and depression. They were the top five reasons for contacting the helpline, which then accounted for 76 percent of calls to the helpline. So, you know, it's a great benefit to be able to make available to your employees. If you move on to the next slide, please, Chrissy. And this graph just kind of shows. Um, this graph is is, is um, from from Care First. And this just this graph just kind of shows the different periods. Really, so you've got the first graph which shows between March and April 2020. The second one shows between May and June 2020, and then the most recent one is July to August 2020. And the usage of the APs, as you can see, quite consistent. 41% uh, initially were using it for work. 
33 and 40. So again, still, you know, worries about obviously working from home, balancing home work life balance, but also now question about the safety, as Steph mentioned earlier on, about working, you know, rich that the return phase into work. And then you've got obviously health and practical as well. Can you move on to the next slide, please, Chrissy? Another added value benefit I just wanted to touch on as well, with again many of these um, benefits that are available, is the online GP service. Now we all know how hard, you know, it can be to kind of make appointments with. Um, your GP nowadays, uh, you know, because they are obviously busy. Some of the GP sessions are actually using them for uh, vaccines, etc. Um, but with the online GP service, again, this is a 24 hour, seven day a week, 365 days a year, an app base they can download, the employees can um, download, where they can make an appointment, um, you know, online, on the phone with, with GP rather than having to wait maybe two weeks before they can actually go in and, uh, and actually see a GP face to face and in this graph on the right hand side you can see again the kind of patterns this is from the Institute for Government um, from uh, January 2020 to August 2020 uh, where you've got the blue lines which is face to face and home visits and then the uh, yellow <coughs> which is telephone and video so you can see you know there is an increase in usage there also these online GP services have a medical second opinion so somebody's been diagnosed with somebody uh, with, with, with a condition they can actually phone up and have a second opinion again there's mental health support they can book physiotherapy therapy sessions and obviously with people working from home now having to adapt you know home office etc there's been an increase in musculoskeletal conditions so there's musculoskeletal conditions there's musculoskeletal support available as well for the employees so if you can go to the next slide please Chrissy and if I just want an example and just show you briefly um of this is a, a an example of cash plan really and as i mentioned earlier on these can be available from just a little as you know just over a pound a week for the employee you've got obviously the cash element you've got it's, you know it's a real tangible benefit it gives the employees cash in their back in their back pocket for things like a trip to the dentist um you know if they need to go for an eye test that kind of thing complimentary property but on the right hand side you can see the added value benefits available so again you've got the virtual gp which is the um booking an appointment you've got the skin vision for um you know so you can literally take a picture of maybe a mole you've got that you look looks a bit funny and then you can send that off and you can have some comments on that you've got sort of improve your body and mind app so like things like um a dietitian exercise that kind of thing you've got the employee assistance program and you've got discounts available as well so employee benefits needn't be you know expensive this day and age next slide please Chrissy. so it's all very well having these wonderful benefits um, but if you've got these wonderful benefits, you know, how do you go about communicating? And in particular now, you know, it's not as easy as just putting a notice board in the back of a, you know, a, the, the, the lady toilet or, you know, um, in the canteen, etc. cetera. Um, one thing that we use in Thomas Carroll, uh, and I think it's, it's, it's a great resource, is that we've actually put all our wellbeing benefits on a PDF document and it's on our intranet site. Um, so the, the employees can access it at any time and it just literally houses all the well-being and support benefits available to the employees we've got the cash plan then on the bottom right hand side which just reminds the employees of the services available and obviously the stress and the employee assistance uh, program helpline so it's all there it's all very visual it's all easy to follow so something like this may be a suggestion you may want to use next slide please Christy. And then finally, just just sort of, sort of um, some suggestions on communicating the benefits. Again, as I mentioned, when you're working at home, remote it is a little bit different. Um, you know, you could use things like emails, uh, webinars, online videos. Um, at Thomas Carroll, we do employee education sessions, so you know we can. Um, do do a do a sort of employee education workshop which shows all the benefits, including the added value benefits available as well. You know, just call, pick the phone up, have a chat to them, uh, make sure they're okay, and just keep reminding them really that support is available to them because I'm sure that they will certainly appreciate it. 
So with that in mind, I'd now like to um, hand you over to Beth, where it's my pleasure, and she's our guest speaker today, and she'll cover the final part of the webinar. So over to you, Beth. Thank you. Oh, lovely. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I have to apologise for the child's background. I have had to move out of my normal office today because we're having building works and nobody needs to have a drill right next to their head when they're delivering a session. So apologies. Love you pictures in the background. Um, but that's the joys of home working, isn't it? That's what we're talking about today. So I'm Beth Husted. I'm the Rehabilitation and Wellbeing Manager at Unum. So Unum are a benefits provider, much like what um, we've been talking about already. Um, the area I work in particular, Income protection area um, uh, insurance, but Unum cover dental, critical illness, etc. Many of the things that have been spoken about today. So the agenda for today is kind of looking at mental health in the UK. Um, this is kind of what we're going to be covering briefly. And the reason I wanted to touch on kind of what is mental health, and I wanted to look at the journey the UK have been on and, and where we are now but also where we were when we entered lockdown because it kind of it paints a picture the UK has done an awful lot of work on mental health which is great but it has set some expectations for our staff and for our population again all of this is brilliant but then going into a, into a global pandemic has kind of impacted on that as well um, then uh, I kind of we're going to look at what mental health is actually you know where the journey was then what mental health looks like in the workplace and now kind of where we are in 2021 and then what the questions that I've been providing for my customers have been many of which uh, Naya has already mentioned but um, kind of just in a more applied approach so what we have been doing and why given all of the situation that what I would have just briefed you on but before I move on hopefully you can see the chat box on the screen don't worry if you can't, just use a pen and paper and write the answer there. But I would like you to just type in the chat box or write on your piece of paper what you actually think mental health and well-being are. Because I think it's quite a good place to start to think about what they are. So either write in the chat box to everybody or just to me um, or just write on a piece of paper just to kind of get that before we get started. Oh, that's the answer. So we'll move on. We'll carry on. We won't worry. Don't worry about that. We'll just uh, <laughs> don't worry about writing it down or putting the answers in the chat box. If you bring up the other definition, please. So the next definition is about well-being. So ultimately, what I was trying to get you to do is to be thinking about mental health and well-being and thinking about what it actually means to you as an individual but also then applying that back to your business and ultimately as you can see from the screen you know what mental health is it's a state of well-being um, it means that you as an individual can reach your normal um, expectations it's it is obviously community focused if you are in um, one type of community or perhaps if you're in a third world we're in a first world your expectations your contribution is very different um, and how you would measure your well-being would be very different so it is quite unique and individual but we're kind of looking at that that measure well-being is very personal to an individual and quite relative to, to life as that particular individual knows it um, but a simple way that we can think about well-being is, is quite literally being well how do we keep ourselves well what does that mean to, to, to individuals but obviously as um, you know working within businesses in HR and your positions etc you need to be thinking about what well-being means to your staff Thinking about mental health, you know, everyone has mental health, like physical health. It fluctuates along a spectrum. You may have a really good day, you feel great, you've been eating really healthy, you feel brilliant. And same with your mental health, um, it can fluctuate. You can have really good days, external things can impact. You can vary from kind of good mental well-being to severe mental health problems. And work can have a really huge impact on mental health. It can promote well-being or it can actually trigger problems as well. So poor mental health, you you know what does that actually look like it can include struggling with low mood it could be stress it could be anxiety and these could actually be result as a result of situational factors a mental health problem is slightly different so it's generally defined as when poor mental health continues for a prolonged period there might not be a specific diagnosis or a specific condition um, but generally you know that that would be poor mental health however conditions that we would be more uh, aware of and know are depression, anxiety, phobias, OCD, like obsessive compulsive disorder, 
with us. So that's just kind of setting the scene, thinking about what these things are. And if we think about what those definitions are, our mental health and well-being has been so significantly challenged in this past year. And there's been obviously lots of research. We need research. We love research. And, but it's really shown how our mental health has been impacted by COVID. People have been feeling more overwhelmed, obviously, more anxious, more low in mood. Um, we've been seeing a lot more poor sleep. People have been feeling quite angry, as well as increased depression, grief and substance misuse probably can hear that. I didn't know that was coming. I do apologise. Uh, so it's important that we continue to kind of support ourselves, but also support our staff to be able to stay in this state of what you can see on the screen. We need to be comfortable. We need to be healthy. We need to be happy and well. So what we need to be doing is looking after our staff and looking after their well-being so we can try and mitigate some of these negative impacts of stress and also to support their mental health. So that's what we're here for, that is what we're trying to do and I'm assuming that is why you, you've come to this session today. So what we want to be doing now, while we've established what mental health is, what individuals are feeling, um, what does mental health look like within the UK? So we're going to look at that journey of mental health. And you can see in a second on the screen how we have moved through uh, kind of mental health within the UK. So we started in the 90s with their kind of care program approach um, and, you know, their progress has been made over the past 50 years. Um, it will come up on the screen in a minute. It's, it's just like a nice journey that goes across and you can see where we've come to. So whilst progress has been made over the past 50 years, the 90s was where we really saw that kind of statement from the government. And, you know, they were showing that mental health was important. We had the care programme and the framework for mental health. And we had the NHS plan, which all demonstrated a new accountability, that kind of outcome focus. The government knew that this needed improving. So moving along, you know, lots and lots of things happened. But 2010 was the Equality Act. You know, Parliament at that point created created uh, you know, an act that legally protected people from discrimination in the workplace and in wider society. So at this point now, mental health is firmly on the political national health service and employers radar because employers now need to ensure that they are you know conscious of what they're doing the nhs have got goals the government are stating this is what we need to be doing and over the past eight years this awareness momentum has really spilled over into the general population as well so you know the importance of social media was quite significant here along with technology advances both of which meant that there was that kind of greater awareness of mental health. So you can see on there the um, things like time to change, the hashtag heads together campaign, the fact that a campaign was initiated by the royal family, but it actually was delivered with a hashtag. That just shows the emphasis. That was how it was, you know, talked about because it was going on social media. Hashtags, awareness days, more conversations, more awareness about suicides news, things like that being accessible on apps. You've got Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. And this is all great because it means that charities and awareness and support can have a platform. But conversely, we know the negative impact that social media and technology can actually have on mental health. So it's just then becoming the start of that kind of always on culture, along with the negative impact that social media can have on mental health. So you're starting to see the story evolve. We're getting more awareness. We're now getting it on individuals, you know, the general population's radar. Businesses are meant to be doing this. This is the stuff that's happening out there because social media is making it more accessible, but also issue because we're more and more switched on all of the time. But for me, the pinnacle and something that I've really used within the work that I do is the 2017 Stevenson Pharma Review. So most of you have probably looked at it, you've tried to apply the mental health standards to your businesses already. But the review was commissioned by the private time. It was an independent review on how employers could actually better support the mental health of all of their people. So it sets out Out six mental health standards that all businesses should be following. There's also four enhanced standards for businesses with over 500 staff. And they everything from recruitment, line manager skills, the working environment, having a mental health plan, tracking and using data effectively, having senior leadership buy-in. These standards are important in what we now do to support our customers particularly my customers. Um, and I'm gonna sort of touch on these later as parts of our solutions. 
But what you can see here on the screen is the UK have got some really, you know, they've been on a really tangible journey where mental health has been growing in relevance in all from the government to the NHS to employers and then spilling out into the general so what does that actually look like for work so on your screen now you'll see what mental health in the workplace actually looks like at the moment so even in 2013 there were 15 million mental health days lost to mental health okay now that was only 2013 look at it 17.9 million so things are growing and growing we've also in addition to this seen a 300 percent increase in presenteeism uh, but that, that's that's a completely other story that's related to culture and a positive working environment etc but there's so many more issues that are happening that we can can really see so if you look on the on the screen you can see how the numbers are kind of contradicting each other almost we've seen we've seen at UNA mental health and stress as the top reason for referral for our services for years I mean I've been there 13 years um, and it's been a growing service but it's also been a really growing uh, reason for uh, using our service and we've seen the need from businesses to provide a response to what I think is essentially an expectation versus reality situation so mental health concerns are now common people are now talking about them so they're kind of expecting their businesses their employers to have this mental health infrastructure so because of all of the, the things that I spoke about, the journey of mental health, social media, these hashtags, this, this always on culture. But unfortunately, there continues to be this disparity. Line managers are lacking the skills. Some businesses still need to change their culture. Many senior leaders have actually only just started to buy into the concept of stress. And they're still not really been, you know, kind of convinced of the benefit of spend here. Very much like what you were talking about is very much about premium. And whilst it's increasing the value add and the rehab services, they're very still very small. People just want to buy a product based on price and they're not looking at everything behind it. There does remain a stigma, possibly exacerbated by that kind of lack of line manager skills, but also business culture, a lack of openness. So you can see all of these. This is what's on the screen right now. Um, Steph mentioned it earlier when she was talking about the health and safety executive. So you've got the health and safety executive management standards approach to tackling work related stress. Obviously, you've got those six key areas of work design associated with poor mental health. Businesses have a duty of care to ensure they're doing all they reasonably can to support their employees health and well-being. But there remains that lack of understanding, that lack of commitment to actually change the business. And the misconception remains that it's timely, it's costly, and that businesses don't have the right resources. But as Naya was showing a second ago, most of the benefits packages that are available, they're all there with the solutions in place. People are just not aware or looking or digging down to find what they can actually have. Businesses have made so many more strides in this area. It just remains very reactive rather than a proactive approach. And I think the thing with the pandemic is that we needed to have had a proactive approach. So the businesses that had that kind of proactive approach to well-being before we went into the lockdown were much more successful as we were doing when they were doing it because they weren't reacting, going, oh, we need to put these things in place. We need to worry about health and well-being. We need to worry about people's positions and seating and things like that. We we all, they already had it in place. The transition was easy. Um, so ultimately, the pandemic, what it has demonstrated is that we need to have a being strategy which aims at creating a working environment that harbors that kind of positive mental well-being um, because that's what's been put on the radar right now so the next bit is a little quiz but don't worry the answers gonna aren't gonna come up I'm gonna give you the answer so you can actually <laughs> just stay on this and think about the answers to these questions and it's quite interesting what Steph was saying about you know aches and pains and and the fact that people you know we do need to be thinking about how people are sitting and if we're staying at home now um, but just think about the answers to these questions you can pop it in the chat box or just write the answers down to give you a little test what percentage of employees have reported new aches and pains compared to their normal since lockdown 44 percent 58 percent or 67 percent what percentage of employees stated that remote working was having a negative impact on their health 33 49 or 86 percent how many extra hours have people been working how many extra hours have you been working and then has mental health um been worse or you know 
not as good for those new to homeworking, true or false. Okay. I can't see any answers coming through, which is absolutely fine because you're obviously all scribbling the answers down in front of you. I'll give you a couple more seconds and then I'll give you the answers, although they're all, I feel like they're probably pretty obvious. So we have 44%, 44% of employees have reported new aches and pains since, um, you know, compared to their new normal. 86% of employees stated that remote working was having a negative impact on their health. 28 hours extra we're working. That's a lot of hours. You know, we really need to be mindful. And it's because most of us are not commuting. And so we are working during that commute instead of maybe taking that time to nourish our well-being and look after ourselves. And it's obviously true. Mental health is poor for those new to home working. Um, I remember working in a hospital to working uh, from home. I actually quit within a, a year of doing it. I just couldn't cope with it anymore. Um, I didn't, obviously, because I'm still here 13 years later, but it can really have a negative impact on an individual. So basically, we've all lived through this a long time now. We know that we're impacted, but essentially this change has had a real impact on our lives. Um, have these things on the screen been things as an employer that you've been seeing? You know, Have you actually even asked how many extra hours your, your staff are working? Are you tracking it? I've seen a lot of employers have been offering you know the odd half a day annual leave to, or you know just a day back to say thank you to acknowledge that people have been working over um, many people are fueled by uh, kind of fight or flight response at the very beginning and we were getting an awful lot of extra work out of people at the beginning for that reason but now that's died off and people have not been taking their annual leave because they are just well I can't go anywhere but even that change of scenery that change of routine is absolutely essential to nourish your well-being we know that people have been um, reporting loads of more aches and pains. I've actually seen and heard of people sitting on bean bags, bouncing balls, things like that, which are just not appropriate. We should also be standing the majority of the time rather than sitting. Everyone's sitting up straight now while I can see the backs aching. We should just be making sure that we are, you know, we would normally commute in the morning. We would normally get up and train or bus or whatever and move and make, you know, have take do two or three thousand steps before we even sit down for the day to start but unfortunately we're just not doing that anymore um, but I just think it's really important that we think about what our staff are experiencing and how they are feeling at this time so now we're just going to have a look at what it actually looks like now in 2021. So we looked at what health and well-being actually is. What does mental health look like to an individual? What is well-being, being well, being healthy, being happy, being comfortable? We looked at the journey of mental health and where we were at within the UK already. And then what that actually was transposed into work. We still had that disparity, employees experiencing one thing, but businesses delivering another. So we've been through a whole pandemic. We should hopefully be seeing a massive increase. Our, our businesses should be like, yes, we've got all of this mental health and well-being stuff that we've been doing. We're going to carry it on. It's going to be at the forefront of everything. But that unfortunately is not the case. 44% of businesses still don't have a well-being strategy. We're only going to see a very small percentage of business, businesses increasing their budget for mental health and well-being. Most adults have said that their mental health has worsened since the pandemic. Well, that's not matching up with the fact that all these businesses have been saying they've been promoting all of this support for their staff. Interestingly enough, 12% of people have said that their mental health has improved. And those probably are the individuals that were really struggling and really benefited from being at home. So it's just really important. Employers have placed a higher emphasis on employee well-being during the pandemic. And employers have also adjusted to new ways of working and increased emphasis on well-being for home working, general well-being, et cetera. Some businesses have targeted their well-being initiatives, et cetera, um, and they've measured things like well-being um, and re resilience. They've actually measured it. But there still, to me, is this sort of real disappointment that despite everything that we've seen, you know, it's been dramatically evidenced that employee health and res resilience needs to be an investment businesses are still not willing to do it. So just wanted to show through this, this particular part was that there's been a massive spotlight put on well-being and mental health 
and businesses, but they're just not seeing this as something that they need to prioritise that can have a tangible return on investment. Um, but it's not a concept that is costly if you really look at all the things that you've already got available. So I just wanted to share already, I know Naya has explained to you all of the things that you could be getting from your benefits, but I just wanted to show you very briefly the stuff that we are already doing at Unum and how that has been utilised in the past year. And we have seen a massive increase in our services. Um, we saw, we usually did about 20 to 30 uh, workshops a year as webinars all of our workshops were done as webinars last year. We went from delivering to 9,000 attendees to 15,000 attendees just in one year. Um, so let me just explain. You'll see five circles come up on your screen. And what I wanted to kind of show you was just, these are the five sort of circles of our service. So if you think about the protection, that is the, that's the insurance. That's what people will get if somebody goes off sick, will pay a percentage of their salary or any of the other insurances that are available. But I'm looking at group income protection, for example, right now. Then the other two pillars, prevention and intervention, they're the areas that have had such a massive influence and spotlight for the past number of years, but only just in the past, in the recent year, have businesses gone, oh my God, I really need to be focusing on these. What can we get? It's all included, it already exists. So the return to work support, helping someone get back to work, keeping them at work, our well-being check. So, you know, one-to-one -one checks for an individual just to see how their well-being is going. We created that through the pandemic and can't believe that we never had it existing already. You know, what are you doing to nourish your well-being at home and at work? Um, Naya mentioned earlier about line manager training. So we have a whole suite of line manager training, which was what I was saying that the use of it has been exponential, you know, 6,000 extra attendees alone last year. Um, and we created um, employee wellbeing sessions and we sped through a couple of extra sessions last year because they were so essential. These now make up 50% of all of the workshops that we do. But none of this is any extra cost. This is just stuff that was already built into the service that businesses have now gone, oh, we probably need to be using that. So I'm just using this as an example of, of having a look at the things that you've already got um, can be really beneficial. We have a wellbeing calendar that's a kind of lift and drop wellbeing platform covering all of those important awareness days. It's got employee employer resources and podcasts and webinars and all kinds of things on there. Um, and again, that, the utilisation last year was a little bit lower. I've already had 5,000 registrations this year and I've had 5,000 registrations last year because this is a, a, something that people have now started to add into their armoury as well. And then the last thing is we were just seeing mental health and wellbeing um, sort of strategy was really low on the ground. People were just going, oh, they've got a workshop here where they've got that there and just randomly chucking things at their business and hoping they would stick. So we took a step back and we started to say to businesses, we can assess what you're doing when it comes to your mental health and well-being, seeing where your issues are lying and then taking a more strategic approach. You know, where are you not meeting those mental health standards? And we will then help you to meet those mental health standards by actually tailoring the solutions as opposed to just hoping that these random things will stick. So the point being, you've got a lot of in-house solutions from most of your providers. Have you dug around and had a look at them? Um, because the, the solutions for mental health and well-being issues within your business don't always need to be um, these really outlandish, uh, you know, mega fruit drops and cycling expeditions. You can make it uh, quite simple. Um, so that was one of the things that I just wanted to explain to you in terms of things like the solution. So on the next slide, you can just see our wellbeing calendar. Um, the slide after that is our uh, uh, help at hand solutions. So that's got the counselling and the GP and physio and things like that. All of the services that, that had just been mentioned. Um, it's just it, there's so many online technical solutions which is what are needed given what we were talking about with the journey of mental health in the UK. The last bit is the, the little bit about the wellbeing check where we can struggle, help with individuals who are struggling with their wellbeing. Um, but lastly, I just wanted to summarise and say, you know, mental health is a really important issue. Um, it was a really important issue and it has remained a really important issue. Um, unfortunately, some businesses have just not seen the bit in the middle as where it demonstrated the need to have that proactive well-being strategy, that proactive approach. And if we start now getting things in place, making our staff really understand um, 
where all the services are, what they are able to to use them for, um, you're you've not still not building that you know that proactive. It's still reactive. Large scale all staff approaches have a much better return on investment than helping an individual that has just become unwell, um, because they've come unwell because you've not got those kind of solutions within the business. Um, but thank you very much, and I'll hand back to Joe now. If there's any questions, obviously let me know. Thank you very much indeed, Beth, and to all of our panellists this morning. Uh, it's been a really interesting journey from start to finish. Thank you very much for joining us, everybody. Contact details for the panellists are on the screen, and we would be delighted to hear from you if anybody at Thomas Carroll or Unum can help you understand where you are with your health and safety return to work and your employee benefits and how we can help you move that forward to a better solution. And a final request, please, for those of you to spend a few more minutes completing the online survey. It really gives us excellent feedback for our next webinar. Have a good day, everybody. Bye bye.